Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you especially for those of you who are not part of the conference and the workshop to come along to this um, concert lecture. Not all musicians are good musicologists, and there are many musicologists who are not good musicians, exceptions made. But I'm going to introduce you to a man who is a fabulous musicologist and an extraordinary pianist at the same time. I met Emanuele Ferrari um, a little while ago, some years ago, at the first of the Tosca um, conference, the Transnational Opera Studies um, conference at the time at Bologna, where he gave a concert lecture. It was about the time when Francesca and I started thinking about this reimagining Italianita project, and I knew immediately that at some point I had to involve um, Emanuele with our research project because what he is doing is absolutely central to the questions we ask as part of um, this um, project. Um, so, what he's going to, he, um, Emanuele, he exemplifies Italianita in a world um, that moves around. He has given um, um, concerts in many countries on both sides of um, the Atlantic, and um, he is a professor of musicology, mostly musical um, analysis, at Milano um, Bicocca, um, where he teaches a lot of pedagogical courses. He forms um, future um, music um, teachers, but he's mostly known for a almost now legendary um, series, dozens of appearances um, in, in an Italian TV station where he gives concert lectures. He gives concerts that he, where he explains and analyzes um, the, the music for the TV station Sky Classica. And um, he um, continues also to, to produce um, um, musicological research. And there's a book coming out um, called The Uses of Silence and Classical Music, which should be published hopefully later um, this year. Um, you know that he's going to play um, um, Verdi vari variations by Liszt, and both Verdi and Liszt are, of course, appropriate examples for some of the questions, and some of the themes that we discuss as part um, of our project and that, that we discuss here um, at the conference. Both of them are men that you can't press into national categories. You all know that this idea of um, the Italian, Italianissimo Verdi comes short of reality. We can't understand Verdi's music without thinking about other influences from Grand Opera and so on. And Liszt is, of course, also exemplary for a composer that where everything that he has done um, relates to the many different national contexts in which um, he has um, worked. Um, the idea of um, variations on an opera played and written for um, the piano is very relevant to the topic of this conference where we thought about adaptations and mediation. We always have to remember that a lot of people learned about opera not by sitting in a theater, but by um, um, playing it um, on the piano, listening to other people playing on the piano before other media um, became available for them. And um, it is an example a little bit like this, the young Bruckner learning Beethoven's symphonies by playing them for hands on the piano. And in a similar way, a lot of people, of course, um, learned um, about opera mostly through um, piano reductions before they were able um, to listen to them. So therefore, that's one of the reasons why what um, Emanuele Ferrari is going to play for us is directly relevant to um, um, the questions we ask at the conference, but um, what he's going to present to us is also going to be a powerful example of what can happen to Italianita when it moves across borders. He will introduce you now to a Duke of Mantua that corresponds much more closely to the idea of the romantic Italian lover than to what you remember from the opera Rigoletto. And so I ask you now to welcome Emanuele for his concert lecture.
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this concert lecture about the Rigoletto paraphrase by Liszt. Despite its bombastic aspect, this piece is subtle and sophisticated and deserves special attention to niceties and details. First, I'm going to play it. Then we are going to follow it step by step, confronting it with its model, the quartet from Act Three of Verdi's Rigoletto. Then, at the end of our meeting, I'll play it again as a whole.
Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Can you hear? Yes. The piece starts off with a surprise. We do hear the line of Maddalena, but we can't recognize her voice. It has become masculine. <laughs> In Verdi, this is a laughter. Papari dove indicore che tal vai e cosa fogo. Quanto va al vostro gioco, me credete e pensare. But Liszt turns it into something dark and threatening. Moreover, immediately after this, we hear Gilda's sighs taken by Liszt from afar, from the final stretta of Verdi's quartet. Infelice portra di dover angoscia lo scoppiar, infelice... So. Maddalena, Gilda. So Verdi is building a new scene altering a character, Maddalena, and uh, creating a succession that in Verdi does not exist. Thus, from the very beginning of the piece, we are confronted with two major tendencies of the piece. First, whereas Verdi always maintains the identity between character, melody, a register and expression in each voice, Liszt breaks up this identity and works with the power of metamorphosis. Second, Liszt reshapes the drama. In this process, a key role is played by the cinematic montage, as they say in the film editing. <laughs> with Maddalena getting an even more sepulchral voice. And Gilda even more anxious and agitated. Then an orchestral transition Wagner-like chords, possibly carried by wind instruments, with the typical loud nasal and almost unpleasant sound. And a wondrous suspension on this note, which is a sort of Pandora's box. Once you open it, all the hell breaks loose. From here on, you have some pure list. The pianist is turned into a magician, a sorcerer whose arms produce sound without seeming effort. It's a cartoon-like effect. This is, that is the Mendelssohn-like fantastic romanticism, the romanticism of elves and fairies. At the end of all this, here comes along an unrecognizable Maddalena, full of noble languor. Chords caps the introduction. 
completing the first part. Now, why this all? The first movement of Verdi's quartet has an opera comica-like style. It's perky, perky and sparkling, but definitely not serious. It plays down what follows, giving the Duke's declaration only a relative and undramatic value. <laughs> E c'è il tatra presso, lo scorda, forse adesso ha un'aria signorino, davvero liberti. E so, Liszt does the opposite. He deploys in his introduction a vast array of expressive resources. By means of these resources, he builds an impressive silence around the music and creates an impressed silence inside the listener. This silence gives the Duke's declaration depth, thoughtfulness, and reliability. leads off the Andante with Bella Figlia dell'Amore, he is no longer the libertine seducer we all know, but it is turned into the perfect lover. Confront Verdi's comment, orchestral comment. Bella Figlia dell'Amore, Verdi. Okay, tell me about it. List. Heart. So, List dictates the dynamics with a precision worthy of a 20th century composer. The intensity of sound is controlled nearly note by note. And this theme is sounded with a piano color, a piano tone, which transforms it into what a pupil of mine once defined as the declaration of love we all girl dream of receiving once in a lifetime.
for a while, it seems that list is just transcribing. But this is not the case. Verdi? Ha rido ben di core che tai vai e costa poco. Ah, così parlar d'amore quanto valga il vostro gioco, me credete so apprezzare. Ah, a me pur l'infame odito. Maddalena, inside, uh, Gilda outside. But here, things change. First, the line of Maddalena, that at the beginning of this piece was too low, now is too high to be sung, thus confirming its ghostly nature in here. And Gilda's comment, which in Verdi is anguished and desperate, ah, così parlar d'amore, in this becomes pleased and sensual. Phase, uh, the guiding star of Verdi is balance. The four voices overlap, but no single emotion prevails or dominates. The camera is in the center and above, like the eye of the God. Okay. Um, Parlar d'amore, quanto valga il vostro gioco, se chiedete so apprezzare. Oh, è pur l'infame audito, il piangere non vale. Taci, 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 il piangere non vale. No, 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 no. The Duke, la, 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 di. Ok. List, instead, changes the camera angle. The vantage point from which the scene is observed is placed in Gilda's eyes. In terms of camera angle, it's a subjective viewpoint versus Verdi's objective one. So the music becomes, in least, dramatic. As dramatic is the turmoil inside Gilda. the frivolous and thoughtless line of Maddalena here takes on the dramatic vein of Gilda. Maddalena becomes Gilda-like, anxious and nobly pained. So, the whole comes to a dramatic climax, a dramatic whirlpool that sucks under the whole scene. discharges the tension, but not the energy, which is needed to support the beginning of the next phase. The voice of the Duke undeterred pops up. 
in this central phase, uh, in Verdi, the quartet uh, displays all of its vocal effulgence. Che inventiva, che inventiva, or sei sicuro. Liszt instead inserts a brand new wonderful love duet between the two most implausible character on the scene, the Duke and Madalena. This duet uh, is a sort of ideal parable of love. As such, it is divided into three parts uh, as a triptych. Fullness, emptiness, fullness again. Have we seen such a duke and such a Maddalena? She sounds ethereal, the perfect muse for a poet. Mm, Petrarch's Laura or, or Dante's Beatrice. And he sounds trustable and passionate. The swift notes carried by the right hand are not merely ornamental, they create first suspension in time, the blissful instant of love attaining eternity. <laughs> Undulation in space. It is as if the whole scene was mirrored on the glassy surface of a pond, barely moved by gentle ripples. The whole scene is transformed and transfigured with the light, bright sonority which ennobles everything. We fluctuate deep in the magic halo of sound. second phase of every parable of law. The absence of the beloved one casts a shadow of doubt, and once again we feel dissatisfied. The Duke has become lonely, anxious, and melancholy. He makes his case by repeating the same idea four times with growing intensity. It's a rhetorical figure well known to speakers, which gives a special sense of urgency and insistence to the idea 
which the theme conveys, is the moment of absence, unsatisfied desire and uncertainty. Will she love me? Will she love only me? Will she love only me forever? Finally, okay, but the episode is fantastic. pathetic climax of the piece is here. But from the shadows, after the shadows, we step back into the sun. And fullness, once again, prevails. Again, we are lead to a climax. But still different this time. After the dramatic climax and the pathetic climax, the energetic one. the accumulated energy is not diffused at all. It charges the starting of the next part. takes off from the top of the preceding climax, thus enhancing the already uplifting mood. At this time, at this point of the piece, the new atmosphere and the new meaning of the piece is, are so well established that uh, even though Liszt almost just transcribes Verdi's stretta, it sounds entirely different and new. Instead of Gilda with sighs, infelice per angoscia non scoppiare. In Liszt, this is not anymore a tangle of emotions, as in Verdi is, but a bright celebration of love. The 
dark part of Rigoletto is put by Liz to good use. Here, his line, instead of invoking vengeance, conveys the priestly benevolence of a blessing father. That's Verdi. <laughs> At least that reverses the meaning. is absorbed by Liszt into the radiant splendor of the Duke. If it were not difficult enough, the whole is varied with swiftly repeated octaves, creating the pathetic effect of a trembling voice, a voice overcome by powerful emotion. Five remarkable changes in the coda, which in verde is infelice contradicto per angoscia no scoppiar, infelice contradicto per angoscia no scoppiar. First, the chromatic line of Gilda is transferred by Liszt from the soprano to the tenor the painful tones becomes victorious. Second, the same line is moved from the upbeat in the to the downbeat, thus turning Gilda's anxiety into the Duke's steadiness and self-confidence. This line becomes related to the exalted zest shown by the Duke during the stretta. Coda by Liszt. Third, the shady counterpoint provided by Rigoletto. Is removed by Liszt altogether. Then, 
the static pedal point in the orchestra. is transcribed by Liszt as a highly dynamic acciaccatura. Finally, a phantasmagoric chromatic scale carried by the right hand completes the picture and rounds off. The result is a pian. A hymn of praise, thanksgiving, and, uh, 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 and victory. <laughs> also adding that incandescent gypsy touch that in list occurs almost throughout <laughs> the Hungarian knife. <laughs> Then a wonderful final piece of drama, a reminiscence. Like a distant echo, there arises the uncertain voice of the Duke, asking once again, will she love me? Note that Liszt changes just the last note that colors the theme anew. Once again. Three plaintive sounds emerge, a final pleading. Madalena sighs and sighs, answering, forever, forever. This is not there, it's me <laughs> interpreting the list. Now, uh, Verdi ends the quartet uh, by natural exhaustion of the musical progress, with Maddalena more coquette than ever. Il vostro gioco sopprezza, il vostro gioco sopprezza, Gilda non In Liszt, instead, the discourse revives with the virtuoso attitude of a Baroque toccata. From the bowels of the earth comes this powerful discharge of octaves, moving from darkness to dazzling light. Arches of triumph and the peace uh, with a grandiose and epic character, celebrating a kingdom of love where happiness and light reign forever. happily ever after.